Council of Order Madison McIntyre Mary, which commemoration on today's murder, Richard Murder, St. Prisca, and also extra votive of collect, collect for the best sacrament. Epistle today. <coughs> Ecclesiasticus, <clears throat> as if I have brought forth a pleasant odor, and my flowers are the fruit of honor. <clears throat> and riches. <clears throat> I'm the mother of fair love, and of fear, and of knowledge, and of holy hope. <clears throat> in me is all grace of the way, <clears throat> and of the truth. In me is all hope of life, and of virtue. <clears throat> Come over to me, all you that desire me, and be filled with my fruits. And for my spirit is sweet, above honey and my inheritance above honey and honeycomb. My memory is unto an everlasting generations. They that eat me shall get hunger, and they that drink me shall get thirst. He that hearkeneth to me shall not be confounded, and they that work by me shall not sin. They that explain me shall have life everlasting. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. John. At that time there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister Mary of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore had seen his mother and his disciple standing whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. After that he said to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own. Seated. <clears throat> Father and Son, and Holy Ghost, Amen. 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 The Church Unity Octo begins today on January 18th and goes until the end next week, January 25th, which is the Feast of the Conversion of St. Paul, the Apostle. The Church Unity Octave was originally approved and blessed by Pope St. Pius X in 1909. And Pope Benedict XV extended its observance to the Universal Church in 1916. Mm -hmm. For each of the Octave, <clears throat> there is a special intention to pray for the unity of the entire Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. First day, that is today, we pray for the special intention is for the return of all the other sheep mm -hmm. to the one fold of St. Peter and the one shepherd. Second day, the return of all Oriental separatists to communion with the Apostolic See. Third day, the submission of the Ang Anglicans to the authority of the figure of Christ. The fourth day, that the Lutherans and all the Protestants of continental Europe may find their way back to Holy Church. The fifth day, that Protestants in America may become one in communion with the chair of St. Peter. The sixth day, the return to the sacraments of lapsed Catholics. The seventh day, the conversion of the Jews, and the last day of the octave, January 25th, the eighth day, the missionary conquest of the world for Christ. Now, modernists over a century now have, have been watering down the Catholic dogma that says outside the church there is no salvation. They're watering down to the point of a meaningless formula. And together with the heresy with uh, ecumenism, promoted by Vatican II, mm -hmm. we can understand why modernist Rome is not interested in converting people to the true faith. As Bronson explains, <clears throat> we are indeed authorized by our religion to judge no one individually. And we never have the right, without a special revelation, to say that th of this or that man that he is eternally lost. But our true faith declares that outside the church there is no salvation. We are all commanded to hear the church, and Almighty God gives to all the grace needed to obey the commandments. And the presumption is, therefore, that always against all who live 
and die out of her visible communion. Hmm. Certainly no one ever will be condemned for not doing what is, was never in his power to do, or for not believing the truth he never had the opportunity for learning. But since the providence of God in this matter must count for something, and we are never at liberty to take the simple human element alone, it is not easy to say precisely what is and is not the extent of the possibilities in this case. In no case is the opportunity of learning the truth ever furnished except by the providence of God. And it costs God nothing in furnishing it, whenever and wherever he sees that it will be accepted. Now we must suppose the man prepared an in his interior disposition to embrace the truth as soon as it is presented to him. Or we cannot claim him as a virtual member of the church. But when we have supposed the disposition, are we sure that we have the right to dispose the non-possibility of the opportunity? If the opportunity is withheld, can we say it is not withheld because there was no disposition to profit by it? Can we adduce, or can one, anyone adduce, a case of a man having disposition and dying without this opportunity? Such a man, one may say, had no opportunity of hearing the church, and yet he had this disposition. How do we know that he had the disposition? From his own statement and the fact that the missionary found him with it. The missionary found him then, then the opportunity was furnished, and our case is not in point. But if the man had died before the missionary came, how we know that supposing his good disposition to remain, it was possible in the province of God for him to die before the missionary came. It may be that God would not let him die before, any more than he would holy Simeon in the gospel before he had seen his salvation, and that he would not is presumable from the fact that he did not, as we heard in, it was read it in St. Luke's gospel. As Catholics, we know nothing of the fiction of an invisible church for which heretics in our day contend and which is composed of the elect of all communions. The lie to which they were driven when pressed to tell where their church was before Luther and Calvin. The church which Catholics believe is a visible kingdom, as much so as the kingdom of France or Great Britain. And when faith assures us that out of the, outside the church there's no salvation, the plain, obvious, natural sense of the dogma is that those living and dying out of that visible kingdom cannot be saved. This is the article of faith itself and what we are bound to believe under pain of mortal sin. And it is exactly what the church fathers have taught. For example, St. Cyprian says, he cannot have God for his father who does not have the church for his mother. And when this dogma is concealed or explained away or watered down, for example, by today's modernists, faith becomes weak, charity languishing, and Catholicity hardly distinguishable from any one of the Protestant groups. There's a story of St. John, Mar John Marie Ribiani and the Protestant man. It goes like this. The Curia of Ayers once gave a blessed medal to a Protestant man who visited him. And the Protestant man ex exclaimed, Dear sir, you have given a medal to one who is a heretic. At least I am a heretic from your point of view. But although we are not in the same religion, I hope we shall both one day be in heaven. End of quote. <clears throat> and the holy priest, St. John Marie Vianney took the gentleman's hand in his own and giving him a look which seemed to reach his very soul answered him with the following words. Alas, my friend, we cannot be together in heaven unless we have begun to, to live so in this world. Death makes no change in that. As a tree falls, so shall it lie. 
Jesus Christ had said that he who do, that does not hear the church, let him be to thee as a heathen and a publican. Mm -hmm. And he said again in another place, there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Mm -hmm. And Jesus made St. Peter the chief shepherd of his flock. Then in a voice full of sweetness, the Curie Virus added the following words, <clears throat> my dear friend, there are not two ways of serving Jesus Christ. There is only one good way, and that is to serve him as he himself wishes to be served. And saying this, the cure of ours left him. But these words sank deeply into the good man's heart, the Protestant, and led him to renounce the errors in which he had been brought up, and he later became a fervent Catholic. <laughs> this important dogma of the Catholic faith <laughs> has been solemnly announced, pronounced three different times in the church's history. The first time by Pope Innocent III, the Fourth Lateran Council, 1215. <laughs> he said, proclaim there's only one universal church of the faithful, outside of which no one at all can be saved. Second time came in the year 1302 by Pope Boniface VIII in the bull Unum Sancta. He said, we declare, say, define, and pronounce that it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. And the third and most explained of all these proclamations came in 1441 by Pope Eugene IV in the bull Cantate Domino. <laughs> which says the Holy Roman Church firmly believes, professes and teaches mm -hmm. that none of those who are not within the Catholic Church, not only pagans but Jews, mm -hmm. heretics and schismatics, can ever be partakers of eternal life mm -hmm. but are to go into the eternal fire prepared for the devil mm -hmm. and his angels mm -hmm. <clears throat> unless mm -hmm. before the close of their lives they shall have entered into that church also, that the unity of the ecclesiastical body is such that the church's sacraments avail only those abiding in that church, and that fasts, alms deeds, and other works of piety which play their part in the Christian combat are in her alone productive of eternal rewards. Moreover, that no one, no matter what alms he may have given, not even if he were to shed his blood for Christ, for the sake of Christ, can be saved unless he abide in the bosom and unity of the Catholic Church. Now the implications of these three solemn pronouncements taken together have the, the following analysis. First one, first point, all three of these statements are ex-cathedra definitions of the Church, you know, the pontiffs who made them. Now, ex cathedra, mm -hmm. in Latin, the Latin words, means that these are infallible teachings of the church which all persons must believe in order to be saved. And these teachings are not subject to change as the popes in making these mm -hmm. declaration of faith that were guided by the Holy Ghost, who is unchangeable. Second point, that the reader accept the reasonable fact that the pontiffs who pronounced these decrees were perfectly literate and fully cognizant of what they were saying. <coughs> if there were any need to soften or qualify their meanings, they were quite capable of doing so. They were not regarded as heretics or fanatics at the time of their pronouncements, and have never been labeled such by the church to this very day. It's an easy thing for the people of this enlightened age to fall into the modern delusion that the men of former times, especially those of the Middle Ages, were not as bright as we are, so that they sometimes said they know not what. The third point. Since the aforementioned formula, extra ecclesium nulla salus, that is, outside the church there is no salvation, it's the doctrine of Catholicity, Catholicity, it is the standard of orthodoxy on the subject of salvation. 
which is to say that all writers, whether they be saints or doctors of old or of late, all popes and theologians of whatever era, and their pronouncements are reliable in their treatment of this subject, if they accept and support it. Their testimonial opinions are useless at best if they do not. This regardless of any other cont contribution they may have made to Catholic erudition. Mm -hmm. The same is, must be said of the works of all Catholic writers. The fourth point. Such a dogmatic statement is not to be colored or reduced or altered by reference to the sacred scriptures. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, it is in terms of such a statement that all scriptures are to be read and understood. The fifth point, the doctrine determines who has good will and who has bad will. Those who have bad will are in the state of sin. In rejecting God's accredited word and work, they reveal their true selves. They choose not to be among those of whom Christ spoke when he said in St. John 10, 14, I know mine and mine know me. When it is responding that certain individuals do not know what they are hearing and is God's word, the reply is, the reply is this. What is being said demands that, that careful inquiry be made. If the inquiry is made with the disposition of humility, integrity, and courage, the inquirer will find that the word cannot be de denied. No argument or evidence has ever been discovered which will leave the honest man free of the revealed word's imperative. Six point. It's important that the reader who thinks he disagrees with the literal reading of these decrees not throw his hands up in indignation and put his, his paper aside. It should be obvious that the reason Catholics regard heresy with such horror and alarm is this very doctrine that outside the church there's no salvation. Because if there is salvation outside the church, what difference does it make whether one is in the church or out of it? whether one is a heretic or in judgment of the church or not. Really, if to, to, to deny this doctrine is not heresy, there's no such thing as heresy. And it would be pointless, as well illogical, for the church to attach it such severe censures and punishments to denial of this, any, of this doctrine or any other doctrine. And the last point, this dogma rules out the possibility of simple, invincible ignorance concerning the matter of salvation. Those who die in ignorance of the church as the only course of salvific grace must be adjudged to have been culpably so. In a word, they did not know because they did not want to know. And lastly, a few quotations from some of the popes and saints to support this dogma. Pope Pius IX said, it is a sin to believe that there is salvation outside the Catholic Church. St. Louis Marie de Montfort said, there is no salvation outside the Catholic Church. Anyone who resists this truth perishes. One more from the doctor, St. Paulus Maria de Liguri, bishop and doctor of the church. He said, we must believe that the Roman Catholic Church is the only true church. Hence, they who are out of the our church, or they who are separate from it, cannot be saved. And last but not least, <clears throat> as some of us we are aware of the, uh, the axiom in Latin, lex orandi, lex credendi est. This Latin phrase means that the church's prayers reveal to us her doctrines. And that salutary doctrine informs our prayer life. Mm -hmm. This point can be illustrated with any, with and every teaching of our Catholic faith, mm -hmm. and especially with this dogma that we're talking about today. Outside the church, there's no salvation. Mm -hmm. In the following prayer, indulged by the Sacred Congregation of the mm -hmm. Proclamation of the Faith under Pope Pius IX, mm -hmm. we see that the Church's insistence on the parental dogma: outside the church, there's no salvation. And here's the prayer that they proved over 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. O Mary, Mother of Mercy, and Refuge of Sinners, we beseech thee, be pleased to look with pitiful eyes upon poor heretics and schismatics. 
Thou who art the seed of wisdom, enlighten the minds that are miserably enfolded in the darkness of ignorance and sin, that may clearly know that the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Roman Church is a tr one true church of Jesus Christ, out outside of which neither holiness nor salvation can be found. Finish the work of their conversion by obtaining for them the grace to accept all the truths of our holy faith and to submit themselves to the supreme Roman pontiff, the bigger of Jesus Christ on earth. That so be united with us in the sweet chains of divine charity, there may soon be only one fold under the same one shepherd. And may we all, may we all, O glorious Virgin, sing forever with exaltation. Rejoice, O Virgin Mary. Thou alone hast destroyed all heresies in the whole world. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.